Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Midwest Dream Car Collection. We hope you enjoyed some coffee and donuts earlier, but uh, thank you for coming to our monthly Tread Talk. Um, this month, we're really honored to have one of our own uh, doing our program. A lot of you know Sherry Menick over here. Sherry's been with the museum since day one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, she is our director of uh, programs and events. Uh, that's her title, but we already know she runs everything because she kind of keeps Chris and I in line. But uh, she's an amazing, amazing lady who has a passion for cars, especially micro cars. Every time we go to an auction or any place to go look at cars, she goes, bring me back something tiny, please. But they don't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we're glad to have Sherry with us talking this morning. And... Uh, uh, she's excited to tell you about her knowledge of microcars, and uh, we'll turn it over to Sherry. Let's give her a warm welcome. Okay, I told Doug I'm not going to actually hold the microphone because I usually have no problem being loud. So if at any time I'm talking and you can't hear me, just let me know, and I'll try to speak up a little louder. So this gives me freedom to, to move about if I need to, though. So. Uh, thank you again for coming, as Doug said. Um, we're, we're glad to have you all here on such a gorgeous Saturday morning. So we had a great turnout for um, Cars and Coffee this morning, so we're very thrilled about that. Um, a lot of people have asked me, like, why micro cars? <laughs> um, and that's, a, that's a kind of a good question. They don't know really where my love for these began. I think really since working here at the museum, you know, I, my knowledge of just all vehicles across the uh, the line have just grown and stuff and I've just started I'm I'm weird and quirky these are weird and quirky so they kind of fit it's kind of a fun thing um, I was raised by a body man though so I was around cars my entire life so I think that's always um, been one of the reasons my very first car although it's not dubbed a micro car was in fact little so there you go we have a Chevy Chevette this was my first car my dad custom uh, painted it for me. We painted the grill and did all that. So it was kind of my my hip little car of the 80s there, my little gold bug that I called it. So a lot of fun. I remember going to um, an auction with my dad um, when we were looking for cars for me when I was about 16, I think. Um, and one of the very first cars that came across was an MG. Um, and I think it was, a, I don't remember if it was a B or if it was a midget, but it was definitely an MG, which was funny. And I told dad I didn't want it because it was too little. It only had two seats. And when you're in high school, it's more about how many people can you fit in the car at one time. So, and I think we've had five or six people in that car before. So uh, trust it. So it was fun. But then when I, later on in life, when I married my husband, he's a big MG person. And now I have an MG in my life. So it's kind of fun that way. So, um, so when most people, when you're talking to general public, you always say, oh, what do you think of a, when you think of a micro car? Well, I think a lot of people think the clown car thing, how many clowns can you fit in a car, that kind of a thing. And actually, as a fun little trivia thing, uh, the world record for the most clowns in a car is 31 clowns, and they were in a Citroen 2CV, which... Citroen 2CVs are actually one of my most favorites. So I thought that was kind of a fun little fact. Um, as I move through this presentation, obviously when I was doing my research and stuff, there's no way I can talk about every single microcar because there, I found out there's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And, and so as I go through, I'm just gonna kind of touch base on some of them. I'm trying to give a little bit of history of how they got started and how they grew. And you're gonna kind of kind of see the condensed years, which really are the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s really is when the kind of big movement was going on. Um, and then it starts tapering off because you get more into the subcompacts and things like that. There are some modern day micro cars that are out there and we'll, talk, we'll just touch base on those at the end, so. Okay, so the term microcar is um, used for the smallest size of car. It had generally three or four wheels, and it usually has an engine smaller than a 700cc. Um, there's sp specific types of microcars. They include bubble cars like the Messerschmitt here. There's cycle cars, there's Inva cars, there's quadricycles, and there's and don't, if I don't say this right, voitrettes, or however you say that. I know it's a French word. <laughs> uh, Microcars are often uh, covered by separate regulations. So um, in doing a lot of my history, 
the reason they did microcars is because they only require a motorcycle license to run and so they were a lot cheaper. Your insurance was cheaper, all the regulations, the specs didn't have to be the same when they were getting inspected. So that's, that's another reason for the big microcar revolution. So. so the Voitra is a term that was used by some um, for cars and tricycles and they were manufactured from 1895 to 1910. So there's a picture of one of the early ones there up in the corner. Cycle cars are a type of, of small, lightweight, and expensive car that was manufactured mainly between 1910 and the late 1920s. You'll see this one, it's the Bedelia BD2. So that's kind of fun. So that's your early micro cars. Technically, the term micro car didn't really come about until after World War II. So we're going to talk about that here. So um, cars that were built prior to the war were more generally referred to as a cycle car. And then there's one definition that states simply that a microcar is a small fuel efficient automobile. They were built to um, provide better weather protection. They were three wheeled microcars. Um, they began increasing in popularity, it, mostly in the UK. And, and they could be driven, like I said before, only using a motorcycle uh, license. So one of the earliest ones is the Austin 7. This is technically not a micro car, but it had a small wheelbase. Um, the length was very little. It, it weighed less than a thousand pounds. Um, the engine was just technically a little bit bigger than what, it, um, what a micro car should be. They were produced in Longbridge, Birmingham, England, and there was about 291,000 of these produced. So this is Britain's equivalent to the Model T. All right, so then um, the American Austin Banton, which is the same one, it came to the United States in roughly 1930. Um, Sir Herbert Austin announced that he was bringing the seven to the US and he built a factory in Butler, Pennsylvania. That company went bankrupt in 34, so it's not very, it did not last very long. Um, Americans thought it was too minimal um, and too plain and they needed to do a, re, a complete rethink. So they hired the industrial designer, Count Alexis de Sakonofsky, um, to add a little bit more Ritz to the style. The Hayes Body Corp of Detroit built the body and it came in a roadster, a sedan, a pickup and convertible versions. It was only 445 bucks. It's like, hey, see, this is another reason I like microcars, they're cheap. So, uh, and it claimed that it got about 40 miles to the gallon. So very economical little guy. So a fun little tiny trivia for this is the American Band Car Company was the first manufacturer to deliver a prototype Jeep to the U.S. Army in 1940. So if you guys have heard of Band Jeeps, which I know Lowell knows, um, that's where they came from. So kind of a fun fact. Um, then we have a Fiat 500. It's called a Topolino. Topolino means little mouse. And if you know like Topo Gigio and all that, that's where this all kind of terms from. So again, it had a small wheelbase. Um, it was not very long or very wide. It was only four and a half ish feet tall. Um, it weighed um, just, a, just barely over the thousand pound thing. So it did have the engine side of, uh, of 569 cc. So it definitely stayed within the micro car kind of realm. It was a four stroke, had four speeds, um, and it had a rear wheel drive. The top speeds for this was 52.8 miles per hour, and it got up to about 46 miles per gallon. You're gonna notice on a lot of these, the top speeds on these, I'm just amazed because we've driven the Messerschmitt, I, I have not driven the Isetta, but uh, I don't think I'd wanna take it that fast. So <laughs> it's always very interesting to me. So they made approximately um, 122,000 of these and they were made in Turin, Italy. Another fun uh, tiny trivia on this is Gregory Peck transported Audrey Hepburn around Rome in um, the movie Roman Holiday in one of these. So that's kind of fun. So go watch the movie now. So. <laughs> Okay, then we get into Crosley's. Crosley's are another one that I just absolutely love. So the Cincinnati Reds team owner, Powell Crosley Jr., he had a dream to offer a tour or a four seat convertible sedan 
and for as cheap as possible. So roughly they were around $325 and $350, kind of depending on the two, four seats, that kind of a thing. So um, again, the wheelbase was and the w length and the width, all of that. Look, it's under a thousand pounds. So that's another really lightweight one. It had a 580 cc engine. It was air cooled. The, a lot of these, that you're gonna see that repetition of these. Um, top speeds were around 40 to 50 miles per hour. Um, and they only made um, about uh, 5,757 of these in, in just for the few short years there. So about a little less than four years. These were made in Richmond, Indiana and in Cincinnati, Ohio. One fun thing that I found out about these so they were sold through department stores and through Crosley appliance stores um, at Macy's on Broadway in June, um, on June 19th of 1939. So within the first hour or two, they had 14 orders placed by mid-afternoon. So that was, you go to a department store and you buy a car. It's like, hey. Um, next we have the Peugeot, it's the VLV. This was in 1941. So we're kind of getting close to where the, you know, that reign of the, uh, the war being over. So in May 1941, Peugeot surprised the world with this purpose-driven uh, two-seater. This is an electric cabriolet, and, um, and it's called the Voiture Laguer de Ville, so VLV. So it was only eight feet, 10 inches. It had a rear-mounted electric motor. Um, they used four 12 volt batteries and they were all up front there underneath the hood. Had a range of about 50 miles. Um, the max speed was only 21. So definitely when you get that electric, it goes a little slower. So mostly used by the French for post office um, drivers and for doctors. So that was kind of interesting. Only 377 of this type um, were actually made from 1941 to 1943. So only two year reign and not very many produced, so. Okay, everybody's gonna say, why do you have a Volkswagen Beetle? This is not a microcar. That is true. So, the, the Volkswagen began in 1945. The reason that this has a prominent um, history with microcars is because so many of the micro tiny cars, they either were selling against the Beetle at the time or they were very much influenced by the design. And as you start uh, looking into the history of microcars and stuff, you can totally see where they copied things and kind of tweaked things and did stuff. So, but a Volkswagen was 13 feet, four inches long, so way bigger than a microcar. And it started with a, a thousand, uh, 1,131, right? Chris, though, Chris, Chris had corrected me. He thought the engine was a little different size. Is that right? Did you think that the size was a little different? Is that right? Okay, so good, I got it right. So um, so both the Morris Minor and the Citroen 2CV, which you're gonna see here in a little bit, um, they offered four seats a lot like the Volkswagen, but they were shorter and they had smaller engines. So that's why they were t dubbed uh, a microcar versus the Beetle, so enter the 2CV. So in 1948, um, 2CVs were meant to motorize the large number of farmers that were still driving around in horse-driven carriages and carts in 1930s France. These fit up to four people and they carried about 110 pounds of luggage. So, you know, very important. Um, again, the wheelbase and the weight and the engine, all of that stayed within the realm. Only 375 cc engine. So that's a really small engine. Um, uh, and the top speeds for this was 39.3. Uh, so not very fast, but they made five mil, a little over five million of these. So that was uh, definitely, now there were five different types of two CVs, but um, still that's a big number compared to some of the others that we've been seeing, so. All right, then you have a Bond Mini car. So um, I have a note here. So the first BMW car, the BMW Dixie was a licensed Austin 7. In France, they were made and sold as Rosengarts. In the US, they were built by the American Austin Car Company. And in Japan, Nissan used the seven design as the basis for their first car, although Japan did not have the license to use that. So this eventually led to um, an agreement for Nissan in 1952 to build and sell Austins. 
but they are now being made under the British Motor Corporation, so uh, in Japan, and they use the Austin name there. So um, th this was a series of economical cars, um, and uh, they were renamed um, Bond Cars uh, Limited in 1964, and they were made in Lancashire um, between the years 1949 to 1966. Um, by British law, three-wheelers could not have reverse uh, gear because they were supposed to be, quote, like the motorcycles. So the way they got around this, and you're going to see this kind of, the measurement has this as well, is you had to stop the engine, and then you started it, and, but it went in reverse. So very kind of interesting how that works. So this is kind of fun how you have to do that. So you definitely can't do a, a big turn and back out of spaces. There was only 24,000 so, uh, or so of these made. So the electric egg, this is a funky little one. So um, this is what they quote dubbed the original bubble car. This was by a French designer. His name was Paul Arzens. He was a painter and a sculptor who branched out into industrial design just before the war. He made it shaped kind of like an uh, aerodynamic egg. It was three-wheeled. It was a two-seater. It was definitely an aluminum body over a tubular frame, and it had a plexiglass canopy. The electric motor went under the seat. It claimed to have top speeds of 47 miles and a range of about 62 miles. So Artson actually owned this um, until his death in 1990. There's only one of one. Um, and just before he died, he gave it to the museum uh, the Cite de l'Automobile in Mulhouse, France. This is an actual picture. I was there and we saw this and this was really cool. So it was fun to see. Definitely, definitely something very funky. So, <laughs> Okay, then you have the Kaiser Fraser. This is the Henry J. It was in 1950. Um, you, you note that the, the wheelbase and the length and all the height, it starts getting just a touch bit bigger here as we move forward and stuff. It did have a front engine. It, it was a real wheel drive. The top speeds were 52, so you're getting a little faster. Um, they produced about 117,000 of these for about three years in Willow Run, Michigan. Um, it, this was a fastback and it had no external trunk and the reason they did that was to kind of keep the price down. So you get a shorter car, you get a cheaper car, I guess. So. Um, just like the, the Crossleys, these were sold through Sears and Roebuck Company, but it was under the name of Allstate. So that's kind of name. It's like Allstate Insurance. It's like, hey. So in the 1950s, um, we enter into the bubble car reign. Um, this was the golden age of the German tiny car. Um, some were three-wheeled, some were four-wheeled, but they all had engines usually less than 500 cc. By 57, there were 17 manufacturers with 11 of the new models of these. Hinkle and BMW created the term bubble car. Um, the British motorists, um, they were panicked because of the return of the gas rationing um, during the Suez crisis. So who's the, who stepped up was Germany because they had a ready supply of these cars. So even though the rationing only lasted for not even a full year, the fans still actually held their love for these bubble cars. I mean, how can you not love it? So, um, because they could be made in small spaces and not with, I mean, not having to have like a huge company, uh, a lot of, this gave a lot of designers and all these guys, you know, out of their driveways and stuff, because they could make these in a very small space, like their garage or a small little warehouse. It did increase the use of fiberglass for bodywork, so that was kind of interesting. So enter the Foldemobile. It was in 1951. This is the earliest of the 1950s German bubble cars. Um, the concept was from a freelance journalist and automotive designer. His name was Norbert Stevenson. I can actually say that one. Um, his backer was Carl Schmidt, who was a wholesaler in Fulda, Germany, who had an electrical maintenance company, and he kind of wanted to branch out. So, they made their first prototype um, and it had a steel chassis with a swing front axle suspension and a swinging arm for the single rear, rear wheel. Um, it had cable operated front brakes and a pair of rear hinge doors. So um, I didn't get the number on these, like how many were actually produced and stuff. These, I just thought it was kind of fun. To me, it reminds me of like a miniature tank. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of fun, so, but. Then we have the Reliant Regal. So this is in 1953. 
The Regal um, was a three-wheeler. Um, they actually um, made a van as well that was manufactured from 1952 to about 1973, so a, a pretty good run by the Re uh, Reliant Motor Company. Um, these replaced the Reliant Regents, which was a three-wheeled cycle car, and uh, it had its origins in the design um, from the Raleigh Bicycle Company, so that was kind of interesting. Instead of um, like the Bonds, the, like, uh, it had a two-stroke motorbike engine, it had a four-cylinder water-cooled unit, it had hydraulic brakes and doors, so all of those things. As a three-wheeled vehicle, having a lightweight construction, under the UK law, it was considered a tricycle, and it can be driven on a full Class A motorcycle license. Top speeds reached 60 miles per hour, and it got 50 miles per gallon. So again, as I say, we're kind of increasing our, our, our uh, mileage here. Um, it later went, um, got its, uh, they reshaped the grill, and it seated actually four passengers. So. One of the fun facts on this was the engine was so far back in the chassis that the way you could get to it to inspect it or to work on it is you had to unfasten the panels in the passenger compartment to get to it. So not the easiest to work on. Enter the Messerschmitt. This is the golden car. I love this car. <laughs> so, um, they actually had kind of about three different um, varieties of this. The, the first one is the KR175. Uh, it was first made in 1953. So it, again, most of you know that Messerschmitt actually produced airplanes. So um, when, the, when Germany banned aircraft, aircraft production for around uh, eight years after the war, they had to start rethinking what they were gonna do. And, and there's actually a couple of different companies that did, well, maybe even more than that, that actually started doing cars instead of the planes. So Fritz Finn developed this, um, he first started by uh, with a hand-driven enclosed tri tricycle, and the reason he made those was for injured veterans. But he wanted to expand to a two-seater, so he contacted his former employer, Willie Messerschmitt, hence the name, um, to develop the first one called the Cabin Roller. Um, the KR-175 launched in, uh, uh, in March of 53. Um, it had a Fictal and Sox motorcycle engine. And in 54, the KR200 was produced. It had a little bit wider track and it was redesigned suspension with shock absorbers. Um, this had an electric Dynastart generator. It could go both forward and in reverse just as fast. So we haven't really tested that theory, but so it definitely can, can go. So in September of 57, they came out with the Tiger um, 500. It's the TG500. It has four wheels and it had a 493 uh, CC engine. One fact that I, th I found interesting was in August of 55, they took a, a super streamlined Messerschmitt KR200, so the one that's just a little bit bigger, and they set 21 endurance records um, at, in this race circuit, averaging about 66.5. <laughs> and I'm like, we took this out in the back parking lot and just trying to go around those cor corners and stuff, I was like, there's no way I would do that. So I thought that was kind of fun. So this is, this is a picture of the Tiger. So this, you can kind of see the four wheels. So kind of the same still body style, but just a little bit different. To me, it kind of looks a lot different, but yeah. Okay, then we have the Nash Metropolitans. Um, there, there's a song about the Nash. Do you guys know that? Some of you might know that song, so the little beep beep. Uh, smaller, this was smaller than the Rambler. Um, it was definitely marketed towards women um, because they marketed this as not being a cheap car. So this had a lot of uh, higher end luxury um, features to it. They collabed with uh, BMC, British Motor Company, um, the Austin MG and the Morris. It was built in England. Motor and drive was very similar to that of the Austin MG. Um, this had a, a 1,200cc uh, engine. It, it came in both the hardtop and the convertible, it, and it sold for pretty close to you know $1,500 for either model. It included, the fancy things it included was a rear tire carrier, a cigarette lighter, which, you know, that was like, yeah, and leather seats. Uh, resembled a shrunken version of the V8 Nash um, Ambassador Country Club. So if you guys know or are familiar with that, it, you can definitely see the similarities. Uh, production stopped in about in 1961 and they had made just a little over 100,000 of these. 
Um, they did make a prototype station wagon of this, um, but it never made it to production, which is very sad. That would have been so cute. So, Okay, then we get to our Isettas. So both the ESO Isetta and the BMW Isetta are basically the same car. There's just very um, little differences. So ESO had branched into the three-wheeled scooters, but really um, because they were facing a threat from Vespa and um, Lambretta, the first cars had a 198cc single-cylinder air-cooled um, engine, and within a, within a year, the engine actually grew to 236cc. Um, the front door, which we'll show you here in a little bit, actually um, opens, um, and it has a folding steering column, and that's to give you access to the bench seat, so it's kind of a fun feature. These are barely seven feet, so these could easily be put front end to a sidewalk, and this was to save space. The reason it has a canvas top is because that's an escape route. So um, maybe it's just to get out quickly, but it's also if a car parked too close to you, you could just climb out through the roof. So very convenient. Uh, it ended production in about 55, and they had made about 6,000 of them. Um, these were introduced into the US in 56. They had a, a fake radiator uh, grill, and they had larger headlamps, and they had what they called the Nerf bar bumpers. A basic model cost about $1,048, and the original version was built until 1962. The British version lasted until 64, so that's kind of fun. We actually have two. They're both um, a little bit different. So we have one in the lounge that's covered in wine corks, so that's always a fun one. So these are the pickup in the van versions of this, which I thought were so adorable. So it's like still like you can get your little panel van going. You can have a little mini, you know, like food truck or something going on. So I thought these were pretty fun. I can't even imagine like what this truck would actually carry. I don't know. So maybe another micro car. So there you go. Um, then we have the Hinkle uh, cabine. It was uh, the 150. It was made in 1956. Um, this was the bubbliest of the bubble cars. That's what they had dubbed this. You can definitely see all the little bubble windows and stuff. Um, it had an air-cooled engine. It was taken from a tourist scooter. So um, this was unveiled in 54, but it had a, a fixed steering column, so it, was, it didn't infringe upon the I set a scooter kind of thing. So um, they launched about 150 of these in 56, and um, in they did about 153 and 154 of the four-wheeled um, later on that same year in October. In March of 57, they reduced the engine from a 204cc to 198, and the reason they did this is to save money on insurance. So these were definitely more economical than the Isetta. They got um, 95 miles per gallon, which that's quite, <laughs> that's a long way. Um, and they reached about 56 miles per hour, so similar, but but definitely on the mileage, it got better. Um, this is, uh, they re uh, when the aircraft production um, resumed in 57, after the eight year kind of ban, the company sold these to Argentina and to Dundalk Engineering in Ireland. So that's where they were produced in Argentina and Ireland. In 62, they sold out to Peter Ag. He was an English businessman and he marqueed them as a Trojan. So and these were built in South London. The Trojan um, 200 three-wheeler is what they were called later. So, so if you see kind of older models and stuff, they're actually going to be called a Trojan. Uh, the four-wheeled versions were offered for export. There was a van version that was covered with a, a rear section. It had a tailgate, and it didn't have any passenger seats. So only six of those were ever made. So obviously, they did not uh, gain on popularity. Production for these ended in 1965. Um, and Hinkle's, just like Messerschmitt, they were an aircraft company and they were banned from the war. So this is, um, you can kind of tell that the first car was kind of similar to that too. So you see the similarities in that. Okay, then we have a Fiat. This is, um, which Fiat's are popular even today. So this is the very first one. This is a 500. It was in 1957. Um, Fiat said chow, and um, said chow to the little mouse, um, and they built an even smaller car, and this was um, an alternative to a motor scooter, but this was at a lot lower price. So they were designed by Dante Giacosa, um, and they were shrank down to about 9.5 feet in length and a six-foot wheelbase. So these were tiny. So it only had a two-cylinder 479cc engine, 
Um, it did have a four-speed stick shift. It weighed just barely over a thousand pounds. Um, they had a rough start because people still liked the Topolino 600 a lot better. Um, they thought this was a little too plain um, and basic. So to combat that, they added a, a, a padded rear seat. So that's fancy. Extra chrome and hubcaps, and they gave it just a little more power. Um, they did grow a little larger in 1960, and they added a station wagon and a van. They were last produced in 1975, but as we all know, 30 some odd years later, enter the Fiat again, so it's kind of fun. All right, now we have a King Midget. So these are another one. Um, the uh, former World War II pilots um, by the name of Claude Dry and Dale Orcutt um, launched these. This was a self-build, single-seat runabout. These only came as a kit car. So you basically ordered these through a magazine like Popular Science and Mechanics for 270 bucks. Uh, and they came in a wooden crate. And the crate contained like the frame, the axles, the spring, all the little fun parts. They had patterns for sheet metal, so you had to cut your own sheet metal. And then it had the assembly manual. Um, you could put whatever engine in it. So these were made without the engine. You could put whatever engine you wanted. A lot of them put scooter, motorcycle, small ones in it. Um, these were advertised as a 500 pound car um, and for $500. So kind of the difference in from when they first started to when they later um, became produced. You, uh, they had a Model 2 and a Model 3. So there's just a little bit of difference there. Um, but as long as they weighed less than the thousand pounds, they were exempt from safety regulations. So definitely you didn't buy these to, uh, <laughs> to, to be safe in. Um, they did go bust in 1969, so very sad. So, All right, this is another one of my fun. Uh, these, I, say, I keep saying this is my favorite, this is my favorite. Well, they're all my favorite, but this is the Zundap Janus. Um, Zundep of Nuremberg was a ma major German motorcycle manufacturer. Um, he had originally looked at licensing the Foldemobile, but he um, found Dornier, uh, Dornier Delta. Um, it was a four-wheeled car developed by a Munich aircraft manufacturer. There were three prototypes were built before this one actually came um, and continued with the development of it. Um, to qualify for the German micro tax and license, they had to opt for a 245cc engine from a Bella scooter, and that was placed between the two rows of seats. So there's, there's a front seat and a back seat, and they're back to back to each other. And the reason is they can lay them flat, and you had a little bed in there. So that was kind of like fancy. They were named after the Roman god of two faces. So um, that was the Roman, uh, the god of new beginnings. So the reason the seats are like that, because you look to the future and you look to the past, which I thought was very interesting. So um, they made their debut in Frankfurt in 1956, um, but they really only sold for about a year in 57, uh, 58. Only 6,902 produced. So I think they're rare enough that we should get one. So yeah. <laughs> So another fun tiny trivia, if you guys have any kids or grandkids and stuff like that, um, Dick's, Disney's Pixar movie uh, Cars 2, the pro Professor Zundep is based on a Janus. So there's kind of fun. So I love it when, when there's, act that's one reason I love cars, it's because they introduce kids to all these little cars, which is fun. So, so then we enter into the 1950s, and by, or to the late, mid to late 50s. There was the growing range of European uh, microcars that they started becoming a little more exclusive, a little fancier, a little more ritzy. You have cars like the Bianca Transformabile, uh, you had the Vespa 400, and you had the NSU Sport Print. So those are kind of some fun ones. You can kind of see the detailing. So like the, the Bianca, it was two-toned, which was you know, very right on that and stuff. And they just, in the, um, the Vespa Scooter one, uh, or the Vespa scooter company made the Vespa 400, so those were kind of, I, th I think those are adorable. So just something fun, but we definitely got fancier. Then we have what we, a uh, company called the Gogo Mobile. So Gogo Mobile was a series of microcars, and they were produced by Hans Gloss in a Bavarian town called <coughs> Dingo Fling, so that's a very interesting uh, town, 55 to 69. Um, they made a sedan, which was the best-selling market car, but actually their coupe was just a little bit prettier. So, the engine was an air-cooled two-stroke, two-cylinder unit. 
250 cc, but they later um, produced them to be 300 cc and 400 cc, so the engine got just a little bit bigger. It did have an electric uh, pre-selective transmission um, and a manual clutch. The engine was behind the rear wheels. Uh, the suspension was independent. It was uh, using uh, coil springs and swing axles. They made a little over 200,000 um, sedans. They made a little over 66,000 coupes and they only made 3,000 or so uh, of the vans. So kind of an, an another fun one. All right, then we have the Subaru 360. So again, just adorable, I love these. Uh, rear, rear engine, two-door city car. Um, they were marketed from 1958 to 1971. As the company's first automobile production reached um, almost 400,000 um, in, 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 in the 12 year run that they had, um, it was inexpensive. And, it, and this, was, this was built in response to Japanese government's light K uh, car regulation. So kind of small, the K car regulations had very strict things. This was nicknamed the ladybug in Japan, which I think is cute. Mom should like that, you should like the ladybug. So, uh, this was one of Japan's most popular cars because um, it, it was two door, they had a station wagon convertible, and um, it had a lot of kind of sporting variants that made it uh, appealing. The two-door sedans model um, was the K111, while the wagon is known as the K142. This is what most people in Japan kind of said is like their first car. So a lot of Japanese people said. One um, thing that I found interesting was that Malcolm Bricklin um, advertised these as cheap and ugly, but he had, a, a, he had his little feet in the door there. He started his own company a little bit later and then imported the Yugo to the U.S. as well. And he left the Subaru of America in about 1972. So as we all know, Bricklands, it's kind of like an interesting connection. So Then we have the Trabant. So the Trabant P50, it was known also as the Trabant 500. It was the first in the series of the, their production models in East German. Uh, it was produced from 1957 to 1962. They made just roughly 131,000 of these. Um, after the partition of East Germany, um, Germany was left with a whole group of car factories. They had Audis and DKWs and um, a few others. So they formed the IFA, which I'm not even gonna try to say that, what it is making everything from scooters to fire engines. Um, made as, this was made as a worker's car. It had a two-stroke engine and um, only a, a four to 500cc engine. Uh, also, one of the things they were facing was a shortage on steel making facilities. So, so companies had to start experimenting um, with other materials for their bodies. So um, the Trabants, uh, they, they experimented with material called duroplast. Um, this was a cotton waste and it was combine, combined with a phenolic acid and it was pressed and baked. So that's what they used for their body panels. Um, this was kind of the only choice for East Germans um, until the VW came out. So um, they actually made a military version of this and I'm gonna show you a picture of that here in a minute. Um, in 84, when Volkswagen signed um, to the IFA company to build um, their engines for Wartburgs and Trabants, um, later the Berlin, the Berlin Wall fell in November of 89, and the, um, they tried to come out with a new version of the Trabant, but it was definitely not as popular as the new version of the Volkswagen, so the Volkswagen kind of won out. Um, production ended in 1990, they had produced about three million of these, so that's a, that's a big number. Um, today, the factory uh, is there, but it assembles Volkswagen's electric cars, so it's kind of fun. There's still the history there. So, so this is the military version of this. So in Heidelberg, they do little tours, which is really <coughs> fun. So my husband and I and our our friends from Germany, um, their son went with us. And we actually got to drive one so that you have like the lead car and then you, you drive all over the city and you stop at different places and you take pictures and then he tells you the uh, history of things. But it was fun to actually get to drive one of the turbines. So that was kind of a fun little outing. Definitely a better way of doing this. Maybe that's what we should do is offer like tours of Manhattan with our micro cars. There we go. <laughs> okay, so then we enter into the 
the, the Austin 7, which is actually a Morris Minor, which is actually a Mini, so in 1959. So the, the Mini was developed into, um, they developed into estate, van and pickup versions, um, and came out with the Mini Cooper. Um, it became a huge success in the motorsport, particularly in rallying, so there are a lot of rallies of the Minis. Um, in 94, BMW's takeover of the Rover Group um, developed Mini with airbags and fuel injection. And they revived the, the Cooper name um, of the original Mini, and it continued until 2000. So, and at which time, by then in 2000, they had produced a little over 5 million of these. So that's a lot. Um, this one, uh, the, the very first one actually launched in 1959. Um, it was, uh, it was, this is what they, uh, the, the producer, um, the brainchild of Alec, uh, is, is he going east? I don't, I'm, I'm terrible at that. So, um, he, he was tired of the bubble cars and he wanted something that was deemed more proper. So they, they came out with the, the minis then and stuff. Uh, it, it had 10 inch wheels, um, it, it, the sliding windows and the doors, they did that instead of the row because it allowed for more storage pockets and stuff. One of the things that um, they said the reason they did this because um, the designer said that the storage pocket was there so he could fit his bottle of uh, favorite gin in it. So um, there are two models of, and two versions, like I said, the seven and the thing. The only difference with these is the badges, the radiator grills, and, and usually kind of variations in how they use chrome and where they used it. So. Um, one, uh, another kind of fun fact is that the designer used the glass go-go mobile kind of as a size and weight comparison. So you can kind of, when you look at the go-go mobile and you look at pictures of this, you can definitely see the similarities. All right, so then we have, um, then we're moving into the 60s, okay? So bubble cars, they burst in the 60s. So it was a new, a new decade, it was the wave of tiny cars. Um, and Europeans wanted larger cars that had larger trunks for travel. Um, Japan started to push into the market with their K-class uh, micro motors, um, but people still just wanted a VW Beetle. So American manufacturers, they, they briefly fought back, um, but then they really went in with like some smaller compacts, but then they went into muscle cars, which we all love our muscle cars. So. <laughs> Um, one of the first uh, ones in the 60s was this Mazda R360. Um, this was the first car uh, produced by Toyo Kogyo Company in Hiroshima. Um, it, did, it did follow the Japanese K-Class regulations. It was only 300, or under 360 cc, and it was under the eight foot, 11 inches long. This ran for about six years. It gained bigger engines as it went. They produced about 65,000 of these. Um, it was, its interior had two very slim line seats and a luggage rack behind, and so that was it. Um, they, they did one in 62, it was a four seater, it was called the P360 Carol. Um, it only had plastic sliding windows at first and it didn't have a heater, so you definitely did not drive that when it was winter. And, uh, oh, this is the one that was the first car of Jeff. I, I did you wrong earlier. So this is the first car that Japanese people actually drove. So I apologize for that misinformation. Then you enter the Peel, the Peel P50. This is still in the Guinness Book of World Records, still considered the world's smallest and cheapest car. This literally is a one-seater. So um, the prototype, had a single wheel at front. Um, the production version switched the wheels around. So um, when they first started, the, the one tire was up front and the two were in the back and they switched those around. They only made about 47 to 50 of these. Um, they made these, um, the Peel Engineering Company is the one who made these in Britain. Um, they produced um, the three-wheeled Manx car. Then the owner, uh, Cyril Cannell, designed a prototype and he dubbed it the smallest and cheapest car, which it still is the smallest and cheapest car. Its top speeds was um, 35 to 40-ish miles. It averaged about 100 miles per gallon, so you could go quite a ways with this. It was literally four feet, three inches long, and it had five-inch wheels. Um, and it, it had, um, it, this was made out of fiberglass on a steel frame. So then they made the, the Peel Trident as well. So the Trident was kind of made 
Um, very similar, but this had kind of more of, of a bubble kind of space helmet look to the top. Um, they only made 45 of these, so it was close. But I, I saw a picture once of, I think it's some, I don't remember where it was, but I saw it and there was a whole fleet of those, so it had to have been almost all 45 of them. So following um, the, the 1960s, we enter into the 1970s subcompact era. So these are not microcars, they're really subcompacts. Um, the VW Beetle was still doing really well, um, and the Japanese small cars um, had started worrying the automakers um, in the US. It's like they had to have something to compete. So um, you had AMC, Chev Chevrolet, and Ford. They all brought forth new models um, within months of each other. And they were all front engine, they were all real rear drive cars, and they stretched the definition of small to the very limits. So this is not exactly micro, but it is little. So the AMC came out with the Gremlin, which this, if you're an 80s child like me, it's like, you know, we love these 70s and 80s versions. Uh, the uh, AMC lacked the big bucks that the big three had, um, so they plundered parts from all of their other cars. And if you, if you ever have driven or ridden in an AMC, you can tell that they plundered parts. Uh, they sliced the wheelbase, uh, the wheelbase of their Hudson, uh, or of their Hornet sedan um, from 108 to down to 96 inches. Um, and then the overall length was um, only 161 inches. The hood and the front structure was from the Hornet. It had a 2.8 liter. It was a six cylinder engine. It was very stubby two door body. Um, this was sold and marketed as fun to drive even though it was a bit hoppy. So <laughs> um, that's kind of fun. Um, these actually became mini dragsters with a, they put a five liter V8 engine in these. So that's kind of interesting. I can't even imagine dragging with these, so. Uh, then we have the uh, Chevrolet Vega. Um, this, was, this was marketed as the little car that does everything well. It was 169 inches long. Um, it was a 90 brake horsepower. It had a 2.3 liter um, four cylinder engine. Um, this um, had an advanced aluminum engine um, that went in backwards in a three speed gearbox. Uh, GM claimed to have the highest level of uh, automated assembly in the US. Um, this was a very poor uh, um, assembly. Um, they, did, they had massive recalls on these in the first year and they had leaky engines. So to say they did not do well with these. Um, and then we also have the Ford Pinto. So this was designed with the mantra of being a 2,000 pound car. Um, it sold for no more than 2,000 bucks. Um, the nearest in concept though to a small European car. So these were actually the smallest of the, of the three companies that did these. Uh, they looked to British and German outposts for a smaller engine and they came up with a 75 brake horsepower 1.6 liter. So, um, Also in the 70s you kind of had the, the super mini era. These had more space, they had more power, they were more comfortable, but they always had a hatchback um, rear door and folding rear seats. And these are just some of the models of the different kinds of those, so kind of fun. Then we have the Bond Bug. So a very quirky, uh, weird little thing here. To me, it looks very space age. You can kind of tell from the decades too, it's like what was kind of like the whole thing there. Um, British two-seater. Um, it was uh, designed by Tom Cairn of the Ogle Design Company for uh, Reliant Motor Company. Um, they built these from 1970 to 1974. It was definitely wedge-shaped. Um, it had a lift up canopy uh, and side screen, so that was, uh, that's how they got into that. Um, it was designed to appeal to younger buyers. Um, they did have some early sketches as early as 64, um, and they originally called it the Reliant Rogue. Um, um, this was due to be launched in 1974. The original concept uh, was explored by chopping down the re uh, production Regal vehicle. Um, and they shortened the, the rear to, uh, to end just over the rear axle. It had a front mounted engine. It was a 700 cc. Um, and they, had, they offered more uh, ergonomic seats as well with uh, more padding um, over the engine cowl. It did have twin mud flaps. It had an ashtray. It had a rubber front bumper and a spare, spare wheel. They only made about 2,270 of these. So 
They only came in bright tangerine orange, so that was the only color, but they did produce six of, uh, of these in white, but it was for a uh, Rothman's cigarette promotion, so that was it on those. Then you have the Reliant Robin, and these, these are fun uh, little cars. So definitely another little tripod. They put the front wheel in the, in the front, and as you see, it was not very <laughs> uh, 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 good on balance here. So uh, these were made in Tamworth, England. It was offered in several versions um, over a period of about 30 years. This was the second most popular fiberglass car in history after the Corvette, which I found interesting. So. Um, they were first manufactured in October of 1973, and these were a replacement for the Reliant Regal. Um, they featured a 750cc engine, uh, but in 75 they uh, did a number of improvements and boosted the engine to a 850cc. Uh, they went 70 to 85 miles per hour, that's what was claimed, but as you can see with the balance things, I don't think you would really want to go that fast in these. Um, the original version of the Robin rolled off, uh, in, off the production line in 1982, and after a number of limited editions, um, they, it was replaced by the restyled um, Rialto um, and made in Worthing, UK. Um, the, ve the vehicle was also produced under license in Greece by the MEBEA between 1974 and 1978. So. Um, Enter, uh, we get into um, the late uh, 70s and um, we started to actually reintroduce electric cars. We have the Alta 200. This was licensed from West Germany's uh, Foldemobile and it was built in Greece. Um, this was a two-door sedan and was powered by a Hinkel uh, four-stroke 200cc engine. Had the top speed of 56 miles per hour and it got 67 miles per gallon. This was built from around 1968 to 1974. It was 10 feet, of four inches long. It had a curvaceous fiberglass body and it was a head turner. So the sole real drive uh, was the sole rear wheel was the drive wheel on this. Okay, now we get into electric vehicles. Um, they they came back into focus into the late 70s. Um, there was a lot of research that was done for the zinc chloride and the zinc nickel oxide batteries, um, but these were failing to produce um, and, and they needed something that had more of affordable energy pack. Um, so they, uh, the only thing that they had then that they had to default to was a lead acid ba battery. So enter um, the Greek shipping magnet, John uh, Galandris. He came up with the idea for an electric commuter car in 1967. He bought the British firm Enfield Automotive um, and they had uh, previously made race cars. The first prototype of his electric vehicle was in 1970. It was the Enfield 465. It had two doors and two seats. It was shorter than a Mini. Um, it was only eight feet, 10 inches. It had a 4.6 horsepower, uh, 48 volt electric motor. Um, they put, they kind of split these um, between the front seats, uh, um, behind the trunk and under the hood of these. So the body was made of ABS plastic. Um, they, they had an order of about 60 of the 8,000 version that started in 1973. The body was made of, the, that body was made of aluminum um, and the top speeds claimed were around 44 miles per hour and they got about a 66 mile range. The factory actually shut down the following year after only producing about 108 of those, so it did not last very long. All right, now we're, now we're moving more into what we call quote unquote modern cars. So one of the very first kind of more modern mini cars, obviously, is the Smart Car. These were made in the mid 80s um, by Smart Automotive Company. Um, it was a joint venture that was uh, established between Mercedes-Benz and uh, the, the Geely Holding Group in 2019. These were aimed um, at uh, producing the smart badge um, in China, um, really is where they, they kind of marketed these, and they marketed them more for the police um, to use there. The short length enabled the car to be parked sideways in the cramped city streets, a lot like some of the others that we found with the, uh, with the Isettas and stuff. Um, the, this car was made um, as a venture between uh, watchmaker Swatch and Daimler-Benz. 
Um, it was originally supposed to be called the Swatchmobile. Um, but the alternate name SMART came from taking the first two letters of the partner Swatch and Mercedes and putting the phrase ART on it. So that's where SMART came from. Um, it only weighed about 1,500 pounds and it reached uh, speeds of up to 84. And we still see these around every now and then. So um, Another one that's kind of new and modern is the uh, Swiss Microlino. This is made in Turin, Italy. It has a steel and aluminum body. Um, all, about 80% of all its parts come from Europe, it's, um, and, and the area doesn't come from the US or Jap Japan or any of those areas. It is tiny and compact. They have the door in the front, very similar to the Isetta's. To me, it looks like an Isetta. Um, it is all electric. It does plug into a regular outlet, and it can be charged in up to just four hours. So. Um, it has a sunroof or, or an optional coupe roof, so it did have a hard top. Um, the bench seat can fit two adults. Um, it had uh, two, 230 liters of trunk volume, so just enough for about three crates of beer. So there you go. Uh, it produ they produce about 20 of these a day, so about one every 30, 30 minutes or so. So 30 minutes, you got a new car. There you go. Um, this is called the Nimbus One. These are actually made in Michigan. Um, they roughly cost about $10,000. Um, this combines the convenience and cost of a motorbike, but with the safety and comfort of a car. This is uh, what is called a tadpole tricycle design. Um, it has high strength steel and a thermoplastic shell. It is referred to as a auto cycle, not necessarily a micro car. And, um, it does have standard seats, seat belts, and a steering wheel. Um, auto cycles were, um, they are a state level class of vehicle in the US and, and, and they exist with no federal level classification for auto cycles. So that means they're federally classified as a motorcycle and, con and they have to conform to all motorcycle regulations. They do have onboard cameras and AI to, um, for the collision prevention. It does have a leaning sensor to prevent tipping over. So even if, if it starts to go around a curve, it's gonna sense it and then it's gonna correct it itself. Um, the top speeds in these um, are about 50 miles per hour, um, a little bit bigger for the Nimbus uh, 1S, which is 75 miles per hour. They get about 370 miles per gallon um, of, with electricity in the city. Um, they're only 91 inches uh, in length and 34 inches wide, so definitely motorcycle size. And these are charged on a regular house outlet in about five and a half hours. So they are set to uh, launch here, they said sometime in 24. So if you want, there you go. There's your new micro car for you. But. And that's kind of the end of my presentation on that. So like I said, there's a million, hundreds of thousands and millions of microcars. So I strongly suggest all of you to, you know, if you, if you like microcars, if you like weird and quirky to do your research, there's lots of them. I found, Chris introduced me to a new page on Facebook. It's called Microcar World. And you see cars from all over the world. And so now I'm obsessed with that page and, I, and I'm on it regularly. So that's just something fun. Well, thank you again, guys, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for putting up with me and my microcars. So, yeah.